Baihan Lin. Uh, Baihan, great to have you with us. Um, Baihan has a master's degree in mathematics uh, from Washington University and a PhD in computi computational psychiatry uh, from uh, computational neuroscience from Columbia University, uh, but is working on computational psychiatry uh, at Columbia and uh, as a visiting researcher um, at uh, AI at the if, for AI at the IBM uh, Watson Labs. So Bahan had done great work in reinforcement learning and online learning uh, on bandit models and so forth. Uh, and I'm really excited to hear how that can be used uh, in healthcare and especially in psychiatry. So Bayan, uh, please take it away. Okay. Let me share my screen. Can everyone see my screen? Yes. yes. Okay. Okay. Hi everyone. I'm Bai Han. Uh, uh, I'm, I, I'm uh, as, as Tom introduced, I'm currently with Columbia University and IBM TJ Watson Research Center. First of all, thanks Tom for inviting me and for the nice introduction. Uh, so as, as the title of this AI seminar has implied, uh, uh, most of us already know that uh, AI has been driven many like advancements in the healthcare application across the board. And, and today I'm going to introduce uh, basically uh, a, 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 le a, a, a relatively less studied paradigm, which is reinforcement learning uh, in the healthcare system, which unlike most other settings where we would assume that we have say patient data readily available for analytics, and then we train the model, then we deploy it in real life, uh, in reinforcement learning we are, or online learning, we would assume that the data or the patient sources are actually coming in batches or in streams so that we will be adaptively learning from new information with trials and error. So the title of my talk is Bio-Inspired Reinforcement Learning and Natural Language Processing for Health. And I would imagine that in 20 to 30 years later, we will be seeing a more real-time driven AI paradigm for clinical annotations and interventions. Okay. Uh, before I start, I want to take a moment to thank my amazing collaborators. Uh, without their warm support over the years, I wouldn't have made it to today. And many of the, the, the research that I will be uh, presenting today is also done in collaboration with these amazing collaborators. Okay, so uh, in a nutshell, my research has been building intelligent agents as intelligent uh, as digital twins of complex biological and cognitive systems. And then build, uh, building upon those insights, I create novel AI therapeutic interface for healthcare problems. I'll be briefly mentioning like what do I mean by that and the state of the art in the methodology and also give a few case studies on how this type of methodology can be applied to healthcare problems. Okay, so, so what do I mean by building like digital twins of our bodies and minds? And how does that differ from building any level of say computational models for a particular machine learning task in healthcare? So we want to create a more mechanistic and personalized model. So this concept of digital twins actually comes from aerospace engineering, where not only you are just doing a particular machine intelligence task, but also we are having like a virtual replica of the actual physical system in studied. So in this case, uh, in the, uh, of course, we are not going to say we have like a space shuttle in the space. We cannot just uh, do trials and errors if there are people inside that space shuttle. But if we can have a digital replica of the entire system, we can we can basically tweak around in the simulation environment and basically uh, predict what's going to happen if we do a particular intervention. So similarly, we want to do the same thing for the healthcare system. But you know, in this case, having a digital twins have the benefit that it, it is mechanistic, meaning that we are mimicking the actual biological or, or physiological process behind it. And also we can have a more personalized level of model. So instead we can have a particular digital queens for a class of clinical condition, or it could be even in a personalized level for a particular patient. So usually 
my research involves collecting data uh, from different modality. In this case, it is like neural data, text data, speech, imaging, or genomic data, and also some other side information that we would already know from bio biology, neuroscience, or psychology literature. So, and those can inform us to build better mechanistic emulator, which is our model framework, which can be in different setting. And then our model will be predicting some cl uh, a clinical prediction in the healthcare setting, which can improve our data collection process and which in turn to also update the model itself. So, so I would imagine the entire thing to be that having the neuroscience or, or, or by on the left, we have biology, psychology, neuroscience. Those I would be treating them more as basic science, tell us about the universality of how a biological or cognitive systems actually work. And in the healthcare domain, we are more in, uh, taking into account individuality. What a particular patient will respond inside a certain thing. So combining both information as priors we can potentially build like an artificial general intelligence system for the healthcare where the basic science, the basic, basic biology or neuroscience inform us about the architecture or learning rules about these digital twins, while the healthcare domain or data can place those digital twins onto a spectrum where it can make this model to be both mechanistic and contextual and can be generalizable for different downstream clinical tasks. So I will be focusing in my talk this particular problem of mental health, although this methodology can be applied to a wider variety of clinical conditions. So we all know mental health is a global issue. And, and also not only one in five people in the US experience mental illness, and also the COVID has basically yields an additional toll on everyone's mental health. The solution space in the mental health particularly have been using natural language processing or deep learning method, but many of the existing approach, even the mind blowing advancement in the past few months on the chat GPT or those type of large language models have been majority of them have been off the shelf solution. We are trying to deploy it into the healthcare problems or it could be generic for similar problem. For instance, a language model can be trained for just this uh, on all the internet data, it's not particularly tuned for a particular biological system to emulate. Or if we want to do a classification task for diagnostic purposes, we'll be just using a state-of-the-art classification model without any additional tailoring. And if we want to have interpretable insight, we have to have post hoc interpretation, which can sometimes to be hard to interpret. Well, our approach, which I'm proposing, a bio-inspired method would be more theory driven. So we go from existing knowledge from the literature of neuroscience and biology and psychology and build those emulated system tailored specifically for our problem. And it will have one-to-one -one clinical correspondence. So here is an example. Say we have a task-driven model, which in this case can have some sort of deep representation. And if we can map towards particular layers or computational modules of this deep, rep of this deep learning model towards different, say, interpretable insight, like some psychiatric correlates, and then also pinpointing them towards different neural correlates, then we have both a very useful model, which is a predictive engine for downstream healthcare tasks, but also a model with actionable and interpretable insights for the clinicians to do both scientific discovery and also guide, uh, uh, guide uh, downstream interventions in a very safe, uh, a safe way for different stakeholders. So take the neuroscience domain as an example. Uh, people have been studying neuroscience in different scales. If we want to create a machine of our minds in both healthy and abnormal state, we can go from all the way from the genomic level all the way towards the society level, how people are interacting with one another. And, and my prior research has been invested into this domain. And to, to, to take analogy with the state of the art in this domain, which is deep neural network model, Use, uh, if we map the Mars 3 level 
uh, the implementation level, algorithm level, and computational level, most of the effort has been focusing on neuro, neurons, neuronal level, network level, and behavior level. But my ultimate long-term goal would be to <coughs> potentially fill in the entire blank to have like a complete digital twins of how our minds work. And in my prior work, I have shown that this type of model are not only good at mimicking human, uh, hum mimicking human brains, but also are quite useful for machine tasks like question answering, computer vision, game playing, even controlling drones, speech recognition, and satellite image processing, etc. However, there are also other challenges, which I will briefly mention. One thing would be the spatial and temporal scales of this type of models can be pretty complicated, which makes the entire modeling to be more, even more challenging. And also, even utilizing the state-of-the-art deep learning model, maybe you have an opt-out-of-box the box GPT or generative pre-trained transformer model, still, it requires a large amount of data to train. Well, our brain is very efficient. It can have few shot learning, and also it can be highly resilient to small input changes. And also it runs on very small energy. So how can we build better model that is both more efficient, more effective, and also more brain-like? So I will be concluding a three, a three simple rules I believe would be most important, useful for healthcare or neuropsychiatry problem. So one thing would be focusing on the attention mechanism, which is also the, the driving force for current popular models of transformer and things like that. But here I'm focusing on more on, on the explicit side where there are external and internal attention, which we can potentially model that can be very important for different abnormal states of human bodies. And I believe Reinforcement learning should be the backbone of this type of model because our human brains, we human interact with the world every day and learns and adapt to our environment every day. And finally, I believe that language can be a window to the mind and gateway for us to inter do intervention. And that can also help us to enable us to utilize the state of the art in the AI community with like large language models and other things. And also we communicate through language. So that is also why it is important. So I will be focusing on two applied examples. The first one is an example of reinforcement learning models with biological priors. And these models will be grounded by neuropsychiatry literature. <clears throat> the second example would be computational phenotyping and an automatic annotation of clinical outcomes. So this is an example of natural language analytics with cognitive priors. So a brief introduction of reinforcement learning. Usually we have an agent. In this case, you can consider it as an AI model. It will be taking an action towards the environment where the environment will go from the last state to another state and also reveal a reward feedback to the agent, which the agent will be taking into account the state change and also the reward feedback to, to make the next action. The ultimate goal would be to, for the agent to maximize its own reward in the long term, no matter which reward this actually entails. And more specifically, we can have different ways to tweak around this reinforcement learning for our healthcare purposes. One thing is that we could pay attention to the reward parameters to understand the reward processing process. Or we could be given the reward parameters and environment and then tries to learn the optimal policy of agents such that we know that we, we can have an agent that do certain tasks the best way it can. So the, by policy, I would mean that given a certain state, which action it should take to maximize its long-term reward. <clears throat> or there are other more complicated settings where the environment is unknown. And this environment can be the social environment certain uh, people are interacting uh, with from a neurodiversity point of view, or it could be just the environment inside your brain, how you perceive different rewards. And in this case, we have reward parameters and our uh, optimal policy uh, uh, in store. And we want to learn about how the, uh, how the environments are, what actually matters, what gives you a, 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 a bigger reward, what gives you a punishment. And 
we could, and lastly, we could also have a behavioral modeling setting where the outcome, well, we have the policy of how this agent or brain or human decision-making process are performing in, as in the historical trajectories and also the environment this trajectory is. And we want to learn how this agent is actually uh, learning the entire thing. What's the parameter of these agents? So how does it bind towards our healthcare problems? So in, in, the, in neuroscience, uh, we know that physical dopamine signal actually represents a bidirectional positive and negative coding for prediction error signals. And as a result, these prediction errors and values are usually represented in different brain system and driving the behavior such as motivation, approach, behavior, and action selection. So, and just having like different parameters for a brain to treat like positive versus negative prediction error or value would give us a wide spectrum of clinical conditions like Parkinson's disease, addictions, Alzheimer's, chronic pain, ADHD, et cetera. And if we uh, were to adopt an evolutionary psychiatry point of view, the mental disorders are considered as extreme points in this continuous spectrum of human decision-making process and the traits developed for various purposes during the evolutionary process. And as a result, some of the extreme version of this trait can be beneficial in certain environments. For instance, ADHD, uh, this condition might not be favorable towards certain professions with high concentration requirements. However, this type of very fast switching thing can be very good at for the survival purposes to flight or fight, right? So you could be adapting to a very wider environment very quickly. As a result, but if we model this disease-related reward biases, we can lead to better AI. <laughs> and so, so that is about reward processing mechanism. We could also be paying attention to the attention mechanism, where there are different types of attention separating in different brain structures. And it is usually anatomically separate from the processing system. There are two types of uh, attention. One is a bottom-up attention, meaning that it is more passive attention, or top-down attention, where it is more active, where higher level brain region maybe have already formed a context or some sort of uh, concepts, and you want to search for a particular type of information to maximize your downstream scene. And it has been shown in neuroscience, basic neuroscience research that this type of attention constrains and bias the reinforcement learning process of the brain. And in turn, the reinforcement learning also shifts the focus of attention. As a result, we go from the simple case of bandit algorithm, and then we can explicitly to model the external attention and internal attention of a certain decision-making agent. So shown here, it is we have different robots shown here, but because this is more oriented towards the AI community. However, you can imagine this thing to be kind of a routing mechanism inside your brain. Different brain region, say when you first see something a very low resolution way, say when you if you are if we were to give this talk in person and you enter this room. You will be your brain will be cued that you know this is a similar talk, so I have to behave in a particular way, as opposed to if you go into a more casual setting where you go to a party, it's gonna be telling you to focusing on different part, part, uh, different components of your sensory space, as in the external attention, as well as in the internal space where you use which part of your brain region to process that particular information. For instance. Here, by listening to a talk, maybe your language units will be more activated, while in a party, your social interaction components will be more activated. And this has been shown that this type of, of human-like bio-inspired AI has been doing very well comparing to traditional uh, AI models in machine intelligence tasks. And, and in turn, we can also model attention-driven reward where what do we wish the attention to capture? So for instance, do we want to maximize their information or do we want to maximize their dependency or economic choices? So these are all open space to study. 
So as you can see from the, uh, uh, yeah. And as you can see from the previous two example, uh, uh, this type of attention is slightly different from the attention mechanism defined in the modern day literature of transformer, which is uh, attention in is all you need where it's powered chat GPT and everything, uh, which I would believe is more like a misnomer for memory instead of the actual attention we have in the neuroscience component, which would be deeply binded to us either a reinforcement learning perspective or an information theoretical point of view. Okay, so, so here I'm, I'm going to give in another example of attention, which is more on the regularity aspect. So there is a counter a hypothesis for the neuronal firing uh, principle, which is, which is contradicting to the Bayesian assumption, which means that the more probable, uh, uh, the more less, uh, the, the less probable a certain stimuli is, the larger the firing rate would be. Meaning that the model of our different brain region, their process to be uh, basically accustomed to a particular regularity of stimulation. And also not just stimulation from externally, but also from, 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 the, from lower level sensory uh, uh, cortex. So as a result, that the ones that actually have a higher firing rate would entail that that brain region would require a larger code lens to capture a particular level of information. And to back to the theoretical neural network literature, that will be connecting to this concept of regularity and implicit space. Uh, for the time purposes, I will, I, I, I will, I will skim through this part, uh, meaning that it is a part of unsupervised attention mechanism where different level of brain region will be com computing uh, information theoretical quantity that tell us how regular this particular patterns or downstream stimulation, uh, downstream activations are towards the upstream brain regions. And you can have additional saliency measures as well to flag information. And it has been shown that it is basically doing better uh, uh, in machine intelligence tasks in not only a generative tasks in computer vision, but also game playing, uh, a language processing tasks, machine translation tasks, and also all, all those complicated tasks. Okay, so back to how this type of model can be useful for modeling patients. Uh, we talk about the traditional full reinforcement learning problems. I would also want to mention two additional more simplified version where in the multi-arm bandit scenario, when you take action, you just reveal this reward. And this, this reward will assume that your uh, reward distribution is static or, uh, or statistic in, in, in a Gaussian space. However, you could also have a contextual bandit where meaning that the state informs you which action to take, which will do better. Well, the full reinforcement learning problem, the action will also have a feedback loop towards the state and it will change your state. And so as a result, we propose these two stream reinforcement learning models because of the biological insight we mentioned earlier, where our brain process the positive reward and negative reward entirely separate in different anatomical structures and pathways. So we would be, uh, so, and, but you know, when we are doing an action, we're usually having a trade-off between, you know, what we should do to avoid risk or to pursue reward entirely. So as a result, this is a hybrid approach of a two-stream mechanism. And here are some technical detail I will fly through. Uh, the, short, the short thing to note is that this framework is useful for both the bandit scenario, contextual bandit scenario, and also the reinforcement learning scenario, where we have these four parameters, uh, which uh, we call the, the, the lambda plus and lambda negative are basically uh, the, the reward, the, the, the basically the weight um, upon, upon, uh, the weight upon prior the historical uh, upon historical rewards, meaning that how myopic these reinforcement learnings are, in with respect to the positive reward domain and negative reward domain, and also we also have this W plus and W minus, which means that 
how you are perceiving the current reward feedbacks in your learning process. And from the literature, we already see that different conditions, they have different level of reward biases, which we can either parameterize as shown in this table on the left, or learn from the behavioral data that we already collected from the patient. And then we can learn those reward biases. So this could also be useful for future discoveries of new type of phenotypes through, uh, through a regression process. <coughs> And we show that this two stream reinforcement learning outperforms all baseline in both mimicking the human behavior, but also to perform different type of tasks like bandit tasks or game playing tasks. And, and as you can see, especially in the IO gambling task, we all know that uh, we know that people have been collecting different trajectory of this learning process. And when we parameterize by different reward biases, we see that they will be having different type of uh, short-term and long-term behavior as exemplified by this addiction, which is this black curve. Uh, 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 at first, it actually uh, alerts to chose the better better decks, uh, uh, basically the better op actions very quickly, but in the long term, it performed worse com com comparing to other clinical condition, meaning that this type of memory or attention or myopic attention, uh, not myopic attention, but this, this pursuit uh, of current positive reward has been, can have a variation of the behavioral trajectory they are when, when we unroll this type of behaviors. We can also observe a similar thing in contextual bandit setting. So here is an interesting uh, screencast of how different type of mental disorder mimicking agents are performing the Pac-Man game. And we will see that many of them, they solve the task, they are not dying, but they have different behavior condition. To be focusing on addiction, addiction, it doesn't care about the ghost at all. It didn't even like avoid the ghost. It just wants to eat the dots as, as soon as possible. And for the chronic pain, it doesn't really care about the, the dots itself. It only wants to avoid ghosts because, because it has a very high weight on its perception of negative reward or penalties, so, so which is also similar to many uh, behavioral traits of the clinical uh, of chronic pain, pain patients. Okay. I will move on to the second part, which is uh, the linguistic, uh, linguistic annotation part. So, so uh, uh, those who are familiar with the psychiatry would know that usually in psychiatry, we use this type of clinical instrument, which are basically questionnaires for the patient to fill out after each session or after a few sessions, which usually come with like some sort of statement where you have to annotate on, or you have to note on. However, there has also been uh, like a, a basically attention into this field that you know, psychiatry, unlike many uh, uh, other biological, uh, other clinical fields, have a lot of biomark, uh, have, have a lot of uh, basically objective clinical tasks for those things. Well, psychiatry are heavily based upon this type of self report, self reported in, uh, questionnaires as as the matrix to to determine downstream like uh, drug uses or treatment plan. So as a result, the National Institute of Mental Health are proposing this research domain of criteria framework, meaning that we move from diagnostic categories to diagnose which condition is which to also functional domain. And I will also showcase that if we utilize cheap sensor data, like how people are talking throughout these sessions or their speech characteristic, we can ca ca capture the neuropsychological features already very effectively to uh, compensate for the potentially subjective measure of clinical instruments. The example I'm showing is this therapeutic alliance. It is arguably the most important predictor of the outcome of therapy across different neuropsychiatric disorders. It has been shown that it affects, it basically tells us whether the patient and doctors have some sort of alignment in their bonding scales, in, 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 in agreeing to a long-term goal or have a mutual understanding of what steps or what particular subtasks are required to gain a success in your, in your treatment program. And it has been shown that 
uh, there is this high correlation of a uh, high, uh, basically a high, a strong alliance, a, a, a strong therapeutic alliance with the drop of, of symptoms. And this alliance has also been shown to be very critical in different types of therapies, uh, in, uh, 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 psychotherapies. For instance, in, in certain CBT measure, it can be treated as a common factor or like a more silent factor. But in certain, uh, say, brief relational therapy, the maximizing the alliance itself is the therapeutic uh, objective itself. So, so that actually tells us that this quantity is quite important. And also it has a very complicated relational structure as well. You could have a patient therapist alliance. You could also have a child alliance, caregiver child alliance and patient child alliance, which more recently we are collaborating with collaborators from Mount Sinai to showcase that in group and family setting, these are quite interesting. So here is an example of this working alliance inventory. You see, they are mostly statements. And then you can you can actually click on a like it. You can actually report a like it scale um, on how well a statement actually tells you about. And then we also have turn level transcript, meaning that we have this uh, sessions of psychotherapy or therapy sessions transcribed. And then we have this item level inventory shown earlier, and also their key table, meaning that some statements are more useful for uh, are this statement are weighted in different scales. <laughs> and then we utilize the deep document embeddings, which are basically some sort of language models that actually captures the similarity between a particular sentence or documents or paragraph with another. So we can map those inventory items onto these deep document embeddings, as well as the turn level transcript that is recorded in real time and potentially even transcribed in real time into there. And then we can compute a similarity score in the embedding space, how similar a particular transcript is with the inventories, as well as a particular inventories with different, different statements. Basically, we have the speech recording, we transcribe, we diarize it, we transcribe it, then we fit into this deep embedding, then we compute this working alliance inference scores in different scales. So here is just another example where we have, but we can also have different inventories. You can have the patient questionnaires versus the therapist questionnaire, or even the supervisor questionnaires in particular cases. And those scales can not only do real time, turn level monitoring, but also do clinical interpretations as well as downstream tasks. We analyze, we validate our method in this Alex Tree data set where there are 900 sessions of four clinical conditions. They are well-trained therapists and we don't have the outcome of them, unfortunately. But, we, when, but when analyzing them, over, uh, over different turns, now we have the first time a turn level resolution of how the therapeutic alliance are. And comparing to the traditional approach, the therapeutic alliance will only be collected once a month as one single data point and as an indication of how well you are. But you know, for as from a patient point of view or certain say cognitive behavior therapy point of view, uh, not caring about the therapeutic alliance can even be harmful and also not to say expensive from the per patient point of view. So it'd be nice to already detect this type of therapeutic alliance in, in the turn level scenes just within the first session or within the first 10 sentence that you're talking about. We can already see that the first rows are the anxieties and second row depression, third row schizophrenia, and on the left, we have patient sessions, uh, patient turns. On the right, we have therapist turns. We already see that the goal scale and task scale uh, the, uh, are quite different from uh, in the anxiety and depression versus the, the, the schizophrenia patient, which has more or less more oscillation. While in the therapy session, in the therapist part, it is more or less more stable. But we can also see that the bond scale are constantly increasing inside the both anxiety session and depression session. We could also aggregate them by entire session and find this type of clinically uh, disorder specific type of measurements of their working alliance scales. And 
to provide interpretable insight, we could feed in those diets of the therapist and patient terms, and then uh, uh, put it into a neural topic modeling engine, and then come up with some uh, some topics that are of interest. Then we can do a principal a piece, principal component analysis to come up with three most interpretable principal topic space. And that could be useful because afterward, how can we interpret them would be that for each turn of this diet, we can pick the top turns based on different topic scores that we are computing. And those will be the exemplar turns or dialogues that actually are talking about the particular topics. And then we can do interpretation. Here is an example. The principal component topic one are usually talk about emotional states and mental health. And usually the, the therapist response in this type of topics when we learn from this type of well-trained, experienced therapist, we find that they are usually using strategies, sorry, strategies such as uh, uh, validation, empathy, encouragement, exploration. Well, if you have a principal component topic two, it talks more about personal experience and relationship, then, it, then you still need to, therapists are usually also respond by having some validation, but also tries to talk through conflict res resolution and all those things. But if you are talking about decision-making or self-reflection or personal growth one, so the therapist will be guiding towards more a self-reflection process or empowerment or planning or goal-setting ex ex exercises. As you can see, this type of method can already have this type of insight where traditional method uh, uh, might have challenge to find. And combining with topic modeling result with the therapeutic alliance that we compute earlier, this, this handshake indicates that you know you have a good therapeutic alliance for the patient or the or, or the therapist. Then you will see that you know what is being talked about when this good working alliance happens at this very time point, right? So this is exactly what we find. So on the left, we 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 plotted the consistency of the patient and therapist uh, uh, in their working al therapeutic alliance space. And we see uh, across time. So each trajectory is a time where the big dots is the endpoints of, of this session. And these entire sessions are average and also non-smooth. As we can see on the left, we can, uh, even from the first few turns, we can already detect you know, which condition is which, where the anxiety and depression has more or less a very similar thing for the first half of their sessions, but they then diverge on their task scores later on. Well, the suicidal patient seems to be diverging the most in other scales. And the schizophrenia patient seems to be more diverse in their, uh, 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 more leaning towards having like a, having a higher divergence in their goal space, in, in, their, in their work alliance, in their goal scale. And then on the right, we have another 3D plot. This 3D plot is the topic space, the principal topic space. And then on the right, we also have this uh, PCA coefficient of different, different topics. But you, know, you don't need to uh, see that because we already interpreted that in the previous slides. Right? As you can see, what people are talking about or whether the patient and doctors are talking about the same topics, this factor itself can already be highly indicative of what disorder types that you are that can potentially inform us for classification or diagnose, diagnostic purposes. And then we could also have this actionable insights. So shown here, we have, we collected the top terms, the top exemplifies terms of what the therapist is talking about are particular topics. And then we will see that how, the, how, how talking about those topics are effective or not in terms of their therapeutic alliance. So being plotted here are the working alliance scores. And we see that there are a huge diversity across different clinical conditions, as well as different uh, therapeutic alliance scales, like go, bond, and task. For instance, if you talk about uh, pr pr uh, principal topic one, which is emotional states, it will not be very useful for the bond scale of the suicidal patient, but it is useful for the task scale for the depression patient. Yeah, so as an example. 
And as I mentioned, we could also do utterance classification. So even when you just talk a few sentences, uh, you talk a few minutes into the session, can we already know which type of patient you are? So this is that uh, we can combine these features we collected from psychological states within working alliance scores with a sequence classifier. For instance, you can have a transformer and we show that it is indeed beating the state of the art transformer uh, by, by certain quantities. When we are trying to produce this classification by only caring about patient or only care about what the therapist says or both terms. We could also have more interpretable insight by having expandable AI like logical neural network to find out what particular sentence you are talking about and why it's that. Is there any logical rules that we can follow afterward for, uh, for this type of thing? For the time's sake, I will not dive into detail. So to summarize on this second section, uh, in my, uh, uh, I believe that there is a hypothetical working alliance manifold in the dialogue space of the psychiatry setting, where you can map out different historical sessions into different trajectories. And then you can look at particular events and backtrace those critical events to the exact time points and then get insights from them. For instance, you could look at this entire rupture event where there is a dip in the working alliance space. And then you can see what is being talked about the, uh, over there. And you can see that the patient is saying, doctor, you keep rescheduling our appointment. I feel like our time together didn't matter or I was undervalued, right? So, so as a result, you can, have, you can basically help the, help the clinicians to also improve their own practice or find out what goes wrong. Why does this patient suddenly stop following up for downstream sessions? Or you could also find particular breakthrough events. See, there is an imp improvement. And what's going on at that very moment? What did I do right? And, and also, we could analyze historical sessions of, from existing data set and then uh, uh, collate case studies for junior therapists to learn from these things, which are fully annotated through this type of natural language analytics approach. And Another thing would be for the implementation science. Say when we enter a ther therapy cycle and you could have two treatment plans. We could be talking about families in this session or we could be talking about work. So what treatment plan we should be talking about or should we just take a break and, 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 and restate about what this, therapy, uh, what this entire therapy program is about or do some role play. So having this manifold allow us to roll out the hypothetical dialogues, and then we can already compute the predict, predict the alliance states and then decide which one we should be taking. It could be some sort of search algorithm or some reinforcement learning method or some hybrid method utilizing Monte Carlo rollout to learn an optimal strategy so that you can maximize the working alliance as a reward. So, so this is the benefit of having this line of manifold. However, when we implement it, it's very challenging because first, the therapeutic landscape can be a dynamic maze across time with its interaction with its own life or even the, the, just throughout the developmental process of adolescent. And also, even if we identify a therapeutic state, we still need to find the best strategy to reach the destination. And also these strategies are usually entangled with the anticipated zero of minds of the patient. Because for doctors, you need to anticipate what the patient is thinking. But sometimes the patient, if they have some sort of transference or something like that, maybe they will be also seeking validations from the doctors. So they are also doing this mind game as well. And this is even more so in say couple therapy or group therapy, or family therapy setting where there are another person that you want to care about what they are actually also thinking. So, they, so this makes this type of modeling even more challenging. So lastly, I want to showcase an example of an AI companion, which we, we, which we recently introduced. So this is a treatment recommendation system given the cognitive inference method I, I, I proposed earlier. So this is a reinforcement learning perspective. We have an agent, it can recommend a strategy for the therapist and the therapist will be given a feedback or reward to the recommendation agent or the 
what the patient is being said is being automatically annotated to provide a rating for how these actions are as a reward feedback. And also interestingly, while we are modeling this part, which is this uh, uh, reinforcement learning agent part, technically speaking, the therapist and patient itself are also a reinforcement learning problem, which is actually harder to model. So we propose this reinforced recommendation model for a dialogue topic in psychiatric disorder, which is the first, uh, first ever of its kind. So how does it work? First, I start with the speech processing method where you can, second, you can do online speaker diarization, which is a method I proposed two or three years ago. And then you can transcribe it in real time. And then you can compute the therapeutic ratings given certain instruments. <laughs> Maybe you can use working lions inventory, or you can use back depression index to see how depressed you are at this current moment. Or you can also have other like patient questionnaire, working history, PHQ, or other type of thing to also do the, this type of rating. And you can also have a topic models, which basically characterize what the action is at this current moment by the therapist. So what is this therapist currently doing at this moment? Is he doing validation or is he doing empowerment? Or is this therapist trying to lighten things up by having a playful exercise? So those are the actions. And then we also have their ratings. And so that we can compute a historical data set to train this reinforce, deep reinforcement learning based recommendation system, and then deploy it directly into our clinical setting. So that this setting could be that this setting is useful in a few ways, right? You could be predicting if you say this topic or take this route, what your rating could be. And also if you can train it upon different type of clinical condition, you can have an anxiety AI companion, depression AI companion, all of those things. And also you could either use, utilize our annotated ratings as a reward feedback or integrating user feedback from the clinician. Clinician can say that, you know, this is a lousy, the suggestion, it doesn't work so that it gave it a negative feedback or that, you know, it doesn't, it, 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 it actually worked perfectly because the working alliance is increasing out of the chart. And then after we train this agent, we can have interpretable insight, which I forgot to show in my next plot. But anyhow, this, this, so this is a demonstration system of how such things can be deployed in real time. You simply input your clinical instrument you like, you do some diarization rotation so that you know who is speaking at which moment. Then you then you are seeing a, a real time annotation and visualization of how uh, how how your therapeutic alliance are. Then it is being suggesting the next topic that you should talk about. And then you could be either validated by clicking that you know I I I did say this or not. Okay, I'm gonna skip this. This is an, another example of reinforcement learning. How can it be useful for long-term care facility for speech enhancement and also in, uh, uh, spoken language understanding to understand how children with communication disorder is currently thinking because they have communication disorder. Can we translate them? Uh, for time's sake, maybe I will skip this part, but for people who are interested, this is basically how in the other way around, <laughs> If we have like a large language models, we can also utilize the medical purposes to cure those AI models to make them more safe and less toxic. So we could be introducing a therapist, a psychotherapist for those type of large language models and then correct their communication disorders to, so that they are more considerate to the users that we are. And you can have an entirely reinforcement learning based alignment framework for that. So here is an example of, <laughs> we have a user entering the chat and the chatbot is incompetent about what is being said. So it enters the therapy room. An AI therapist is talking through this chatbot and corrects itself. And then we have an AI critic basically telling it, you know, after the therapy session, this large language models <laughs> is actually more human-like and less manipulative and less gaslighting. So to summarize, I propose this by uh, take neuroscience an example. We could have this bio-inspired AI framework, which is both actionable and predictive and interpretable. And the, di the digital health paradigm that I'm interested in is actually to model all three parts. We have doctor, patient, and agent. And, we, and sometimes in my prior example uh, experience, the human interface is, is actually the hardest part 
uh, 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 in, in contrary to many might think. And we and I I also train model that can have reusable weights in different contexts. You can have this real time automatic annotation system. You can also have a patient and chatbot which utilize the same annotator and strategizer. Or you could also have the strategizer to as an AI companion to help the therapist. And also, lastly, you could also have a summarizer to summarize historical data for educational training purposes to train our next generation uh, therapists or, or clinicians. And, and to on, on the intelligent interface aspect, traditionally we have measurements, some reinforcement learning agent, and our interface. Now I simply introduce more biological and cognitive priors into them, and then have some representational inference method, which allow us to also combine with neural imaging and the other type. So as an outlook, uh, I believe that in the future, in 20 or 30 years, we will be looking more and more into this real-time AI paradigm for healthcare. So there are several things that we can think. First of all, we can have iterative data collection. <laughs> By iterative, I mean that not only you are doing real-time connection of new data, uh, but also you are collecting new data for follow-up visits, say for next time patient intake, what question that you should be asking the to gain the most informative insights. And those all require some sort of reinforcement learning method. And you could also have this type of real-time analytics and also if we, are, if we are also building digital twins with this type of reinforcement learning agents, can we adapt these digital twins alongside the patients every time this patient comes in? And, or, in or, or for inpatient services, every day it's being updated. And also it also not only updates individual models, but also updates for particular disorders and also allow us to do virtual screening and other things. And my research program, if I were to have the pleasure to join Mount Sinai, I would like to uh, do more upon the real-time digital measurement aspects and also, also accommodate for more AI companions for clinicians, including not only annotation, but also data visualization recommendations, and also image-guided intervention, which is another line of work, which I barely mentioned, my in your imaging background and how can we utilize those connectomics or functional imaging data to inform uh, interventions and also to utilize some new technology like extended reality speech enhancement techniques for other type of uh, 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 care, uh, uh, patient cares or in pediatric cares or other departments. I was I will stop at my uh, uh, this slide. Uh, and open for question. Basically, I contribute to introducing this bio-inspired AI as a mechanistic framework to model patient response. And I propose the reinforcement learning that characterize attention mechanism, reward processing, and changing process of neuropsychiatric disorder. I propose a real-time turn-level analytic solution for therapeutic alliance for diets and extendable to other psychometric instruments, and also provides customized <coughs> data pipeline for effective deployments, such as data management system, which I also didn't mention, speaker diarization realization system, and data visualization system. And also propose the AI companion, which is a, 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 with recommendation system annotating historical transcript, with also having interpretable insights. And as a side note, uh, uh, I, uh, currently we have this very exciting collaboration with the psychiatry department here at Mount Sinai on, uh, on on their group and family-based cognitive behavior therapy. And lastly, potentially extension to per, uh, large language models and other supporting tools. Okay, that is my, uh, that concludes my talk. Yeah, I'm open to, to, to questions. Thank you, Bayan. Absolutely outstanding talk, enormously prolific, a lot of very exciting ideas. Uh, although I think uh, AI bots at the end will replace most psychiatrists because humans are so much more comfortable speaking to machines anecdotally okay. than, than uh, telling their deepest secrets to other humans. But joking aside, I'm sure there are many, many questions. So uh, please raise your hand. Otherwise, I start with one. 
Can you I have one question regarding the first pro project, the reinforcement learning one? I think it was slide 30 or so. Okay. Um, so you split the reward into the positive and negative reward in two different models, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, um, what if so is there because uh, it's balanced bad, but if there is no parameter exchange, how would that model learn at all? If you yeah. really split uh, the updates completely separate into two systems. Yeah, so basically, as you can see, uh, uh, the representation of the reward uh, of, of the value of that reward in, for instance, if you're familiar with like, uh, like model free model, uh, uh, like Q learning, which means that you have a representation of some sort of table which characterize what's the value of a particular action. We have, we, we keep two, two tables and then we do actions, we sum them together. But when we do updates, we update them both. So that is how these entire scenes are working. So here is an algorithm. When we are doing updates, we do them separately. But since we assume that the reward feedback are also coming in two stream, meaning that the reward can be both the, the, the positive reward and also the punishment, the negative reward. This is very similar to in human beings. Usually we have a hard time to characterize for just one objectives. Usually we will be weighing the risk and also the benefit, which in entirely different modality. So we need to have a mechanism to update them separately in that route. But the action selection process is a hybrid process where we will be taking into account basically both votes, both votes from the risk side and also the reward side. So, but if you get both, right, the positive and the negative one, yes. isn't then just uh, one model, the mirror image of the other one, because it's, it's, I mean, the reward still lives on a, on, I suspect, on a continuous scale. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, so here are like two assumptions that are slightly different from the reinforcement learning community. So one is that you're right, we can always scale it to certain ways, right? The reward doesn't matter, but it matters in healthcare domain because those rewards, they are separate streams since they might be in different modality. So that is one assumption that we are currently making. And the second thing is that uh, uh, they are not mirroring. It's not like I have a positive reward. So in the negative domain, I have a negative of that positive reward. It's not the same. They are separate. So, so for instance, in the Pac-Man uh, example, eating dogs is a positive reward and died or being, be, being captured or being frozen. That is a negative penalty that will be living in separate space. And, 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 and so this is also uh, similar to what not similar, but you know, it's also relating to the distributional reinforcement learning a community where they separate the rewarding even finer details and how can they precise them differently. But in our cases, we, we explicitly assume that positive and negative reward are in different things. And it will be quite useful for, for, for say doing psychological experiment or clinical experiment, because usually when we have those different modalities, those things, we should be treating them separately in the first place. And also if you combine with other neural imaging, maybe we want to report the functional imaging while we do this task and certain components, maybe some averseness or other type, we want to also characterize them here, then it's not gonna be like a one dimensional reward scale as before, but a more complicated version as, as characterized in, in, in this type of model. Mm -hmm. Great. Any additional questions? I know we are a few minutes over, but I'm sure there's time for one more. Okay, good. Otherwise, Bahan, thank you very much. Uh, again, excellent work, very timely. Uh, and uh, it's, it's certainly psychiatry is going to be one of the fields in healthcare that's going to benefit drastically by the new wave of uh, machine learning models. It's because it's, of course, a language based discipline. Uh, and that's where uh, of course, uh, these new models uh, work brilliantly. Mm. Good. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody, for joining. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.